So uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Guranjan for the invitation and for a very nice introduction. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here at IIT Bombay and to give lectures about phase field crystal modeling and its application. Uh, it is a, a research project I picked up uh, when I was a PhD student uh, working with Professor Karma. Uh, and th I think the first paper of the phase field crystal uh, is back in 2002 uh, by Professor Elder. So now it's like 20th year. So uh, I would assume uh, it's going to be like uh, uh, the other booming areas, such as phase field. Uh, I think it developed as early as like 1980s. So uh, I, I would think the phase field crystal modeling uh, uh, still have a lot of uh, uh, research in interest in it. So uh, first, I would like to thank Professor Guru Rajan for, for inviting me and also for the uh, department to uh, host my stay. Thank you very much. So uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, this course is, is, uh, is offered by me and Professor Guru Rajan, and we are going to have an afternoon tutorial session. Okay, so it's a 10-day course, so I hope that uh, after the, this 10-day course, uh, you will find the phase field crystal modeling useful, and uh, hopefully you will consider to use that uh, to, to tackle the material problem you have in mind. So that, that's our goal. So I'm going to, uh, uh, since it's a 10-day course, I'm going to slow down a little bit. It's not like a research talk we usually give in, at a conference. So just feel free to stop me anytime if you uh, would like to clarify uh, some points that uh, I probably didn't uh, state clearly. So feel free to stop me anytime, all right? So first, just a little bit thing about uh, uh, where I'm from. So I'm from National Tsinghua University uh, in Taiwan. So as you can see, uh, it's, uh, the university basically is in the town of Xinzhu. So uh, Taiwan is here and it's a zooming plot. So we are roughly at the northwest uh, corner uh, of Taiwan. So uh, nearby cities that you probably know is Hong Kong, Shanghai, and uh, Japan is here, Tokyo is here, and that, that's the South Korea. Uh, I would say it's, the, the weather is pretty much like Mumbai. At least that's what I was experiencing in the last week. So everything, uh, it's very comfortable. That is our physics building. Uh, so if you have a chance, uh, feel free, uh, I mean, Welcome, I would welcome to you to visit, visit Taiwan and especially uh, maybe uh, stay for a few times in our campus. So um, our campus is uh, like uh, IIT Bombay. We have uh, very beautiful lakes and trees and we also have a lot of uh, art decorations. Uh, so um, if you got the, the opportunity to visit Taiwan, uh, do let me know. I will be more than happy to host you. So here is uh, uh, the, the students and faculty members from our department. And yeah, you, as you can see, uh, it's a very nice campus like what you have here. Okay, all right. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, so just like uh, Guru introduced, uh, I'm interested in the pattern formation. So I'm interested in the pattern formation in condensed metaphysics, in the material science, and in biophysics. So here are just a few examples. For example, my interesting to know, for example, during the uh, snowflake morphology, right? Everything uh, just starts from a uh, water molecule, but how can you always have this six-fold symmetry coming up, right? So what caused this morphology? And basically, what we know so far is that uh, you have to consider the uh, interfacial surface anisotropy and also the ki kinetic anisotropy. Uh, but what I'm, I'm interested in is what's the physical origin of those anisotropy? Can you actually uh, relate the atomistic details to the microscopic surface property? Because we, we know, as I'm showing in the middle graph, uh, usually we know for different crystal structures, such here I'm showing is BCC and FCC. They show this universal trend of the anisotropy. FCC always is clustered in some places here for different uh, material I'm showing. But uh, for BCC, uh, you can see the anisotropy of the surface property is different. So uh, one of my interests, uh, as I will also talk about in the following lectures, is what's the physical origin, and that's also very important in the phase field modeling. So also, for example, for the uh, kinetics, right? If you undercool the liquid a little bit and you start to see the solidification problem, so what I'm showing here is the temporal coefficient. Uh, it shows a universal relation between the, uh, the, 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 the latent heat of material and also the surface energy. So as you can see, for different crystal structure, it always gives you a different uh, temporal coefficient. So I'm also interested in answer, 
answering this kind of question, what gives rise to this universality in, in materials, right? Uh, and the other side of my research is that uh, it's also related to the panel formation. I'm using the idea of panel formation, such as the face here crystal, to model the materi material growth, such as the, uh, for example, here is the uh, grain growth at the nano scale, and also the nano island formation. And right on the right here is the grain bundle grouping. So all of those three are from the phase field crystal modeling. So I'm going to talk that uh, a little bit more uh, during the lectures. So that's the condensed matter phys physics side of my research. But I'm also interested in applying the panel formation idea in biophysics. So here are a few examples of some projects we were uh, working on. For example, I'm interested to know the vegetation pattern occurring in nature. So here is one of uh, the examples showing the uh, desert pattern you can observe in the South Africa. So you, in the arid land, usually you will see a lot of like circles. And when you see from the uh, satellite photos, you will see a lot of these circles arranged in these uh, hexagonal patterns. So there is some fundamental mechanism that cause that happening, right? And we also starting like uh, population dynamics. Our re recent work, uh, for example, uh, we talk about how the confinement effect affects the hunter virus uh, spreading. So here we were talking about how the uh, survival and extinction criteria changes as you confine species in certain environments. So also we, a, a very standard uh, topic in the pattern formation field is the Turing instability. So we also talked about uh, what if the uh, species, they, ha they, they have this sort of uh, interaction, would that cause the, 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 the pattern ch change or the characteristic change with those interactions? So we work on several topics, so I'm not going, going to go through all of them, but things like we also work on the cardiac uh, di uh, dynamics recently. Uh, but basically, we are just uh, interested in the pattern formation side of all these biophysics uh, projects. So uh, I think we're going to have uh, like uh, lunch together. So if you have any question related to material science, I'm more than happy to uh, di have a discussion with you. But if you are also interested in the phys like the different subject, like the pattern formation, or how it can apply to a biosystem, uh, feel free to let me know. I'll also uh, be happy to have a conversation. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about three things, right? So first I'm going to just show you what's the uh, mathematical uh, expression for the phase field crystal model, and what's the, what's the, dynamic, what's the dynamical equation of it, and uh, how we can comprehend uh, what is this phase field crystal model? All right. And in the following, very quickly, I'm going to show you several different examples of the PFC applications. So hopefully you can relate to what I'm showing you to your own research topic. So if you have something in mind, maybe uh, that will give you a uh, much stronger motivation during the rest of the lectures. And since the phase field crystal basically start from this kind of free energy, and it is it's basically, it is the sweet Holmberg equation free energy functional. And that has its roots on the Rayleigh Bernard convection. So since we are going to see this kind of free energy functional repeatedly, I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, what gives rise to this form, this particular form, and why it gives rise to patterns like uh, triangle lattice in two dimensions or the DCC in three dimensions. Okay, so that's our plan today. Okay, so first, uh, just let me show you quickly, uh, everything start with this uh, free energy functional, very simple. So. You only have uh, two things, right? One is the Poisson, is the field. It's a function of space and time, okay? So if you think about that as like a phase field, it's like a phase field uh, variable phi, okay? So it's a function of space and time. But uh, you also have some other, something else. You have this epsilon parameter. So that's one of the control parameter you have in the phase field. So this fringe function is really simple, you only have one field variable per side, and the other is uh, just a number, epsilon, it's, it's a parameter you can choose. And we are not going to talk about the physics behind it today. We are going to leave that to the third lecture. So I'm going to just show you uh, the free energy functional and just give a very brief concept of this free energy functional, why it prefer to form like patterns. Uh, the second lecture, we are going to go deeper into the mathematic aspects of the PFC. But the third lecture, as I promise, I will show you more the physics about it. Okay, so it looks like a phase field model, but as you can see, there's a kernel here. It's a Laplacian plus one squared. So it 
gives you a higher order of Laplacian, right, if you compare to the phase field model. But what this kernel do is actually quite important because if you assuming the Poisson is a function of space and time, right? So this kernel prefer to form a characteristic length scale. And why is that? Because if I just ignore the nonlinearity for now, so the system is going to lower the free energy if we if we use the uh, relaxation dynamic to run the simulate uh, to relax the free energy functional, we know the system is going to toward the energy minimum. So this kernel, what it it, it does is actually it, it prefer to have this uh, plane wave with the wave number the magnitude equal to one. Because if you just say okay, I have something uh, periodic happening in the space, something like a plane wave here. So when you plug in this Poisson as this kind of plane wave, right? So the Laplacian here imme immediately gives you this minus k square. So if that's minus k square, so this minus k square plus one, the whole thing square, you want to minimize that. The only solution you are expect you are expecting to get is that the magnitude of this wave wavelength has to be one. So just looking at the quadratic parts of this free inch functional, it automatically favor you to get this uh, periodic structure in space and with the wave number equal to one, right? So I'm not going to talk anything deeper than that today, but you can see that just from the, uh, this uh, Laplace in plus one cur square kernel, you are expecting to get something periodical in space. And compared to the phase field, you have this uh, uh, gradient phi square, and that's going to give you just an interface, but nothing periodic happening. Right, so you can immediately see the fund fundamental difference between the phase field crystal and the phase field model. All right. So uh, feel free to interrupt me or stop me anytime if, if there's any question. All right. Okay, but if we only have these quadratic kernels, what you are expecting is to see a lot of uh, plane waves growing or decaying, right? Uh, depends whether uh, the system is stable or, or unstable. But you're not expecting to see any pattern. So in the pattern formation theory, the pattern always emerges from the nonlinearity. So this uh, psi to the fourth power term, the, the quartic term in the face of a crystal is going to give us the, uh, the, the body center cubic lattices in three dimensions. And it, it's going to give us the hexagonal lattice in two dimensions. But I'm going to leave that to the lecture tomorrow. But here I'm just give you a, a quick concept about you are expecting two features for any pattern forming system. One is that the, the system has to pick up a preferred length scale. Like here is from this uh, Laplace in plus one kernel, right? And the other thing is you will need to have this interaction between different plane waves. And that's a nonlinear interaction will give rise to certain pattern. So different, for example, different crystal structure will have a different competition between the density waves. So uh, for certain nonlinearity, uh, if you can arrange different kind of nonlinearity the combination, uh, it can give you it, it can give you different kind of crystal structure. Okay, but we're going to see a lot of detail uh, in the following lecture. So here's just a quick concept. So based on this free energy functional, uh, Poisson, as, as I described, is just a, a density field, or uh, yeah, actually it is a density field, but relative to a reference state. Uh, we are going to cover that uh, uh, in detail as well later. But Poisson just a field variable. Okay, so from here we know that it, it's going to prefer a periodic structure. Okay, so with this free energy functional, the phase field crystal basically is using this conserved relaxational dynamics. Right. So uh, quite basically, it's, it's uh, similar to the uh, Cahier equation. You uh, the way uh, Poisson evolve right depends on the grading of the chemical potential, take the divergence of that. Right, so it's a locally driven conserved dynamics. Uh, and the reason we require a conserved dynamic is we, uh, the Poisson here has the meaning of the density. And if we are considered like a canonical ensemble, so we are expecting uh, the, the number of particles conserved in our system. So we are using this conserved dynamics. But of course, depending on your material science problem, you can also use the other different kind of relaxation dynamics. So it could be like a grain canonical, you can fix the chemical potential, uh, things like that. But today I'm, going, I'm just going to uh, focus on this uh, conserved re reaction dynamics. 
Okay, so that's the, uh, the the typical equation of motion when you read the paper from the PFC. They are going to show. You. All right. So because it is a conserved dynamics, so the mean density of the system is going to be conserved. So rather there's only one parameter like epsilon. There are actually two parameters because I can assign different density, different mean density to a system, and also control the epsilon. So those two parameters will give me a different outcome of my system. So actually are two parameters controlling the basic crystal. So for example, usually we are expecting, if we are packing more and more particles into our system, I'm expecting to see a phase transition from the liquid to a solid state because the system is, is getting denser and denser. So here, if I uh, typically, if I uh, use a fixed value of epsilon, but I start to increase the value of the mean density here, I can also see that transition happen from liquid state to a solid state, okay? But I'm going to uh, show you the details uh, in the following lecture. All right, so here is just one example of uh, the PFC modeling. So what I'm showing you here is a cross-section of these 3D uh, simulations. So uh, it's a cross-section and it's a three-dimensional system. So the PFC favor in 3D is a BCC lattices. So I'm showing you here just a cross-section of this uh, 001 plane, all right? So you can see a very nice uh, solid liquid coexistence system. And immediately you can see a feature of the PFC, quite different than the phase field, is that you see all the uh, atomic details, like atoms appearing in the system. And because of that, you immediately pick up all the detail of this atomistic description, like all the different kind of orientations and lattice plane, right? So I'm, uh, writing here is that you can have a uh, different orientations, let, let is plans, uh, let is plan, and also you, you have this uh, solid liquid uh, interface. And because of you have all the details like one one zero and one one zero one zero zero, right? So uh, you can imagine that if the in, the solid liquid interface now uh, is occurring at this one zero zero and the liquid over here, you can see the difference in the atomistic details is going to give you the different interfacial energy. Right? Very intuitive. So somehow you can say the interfacial anisotropy is built in in the phase field crystal model. You don't need to add anything else. If you run this model, you should expect to get the interfacial anisotropy itself. You don't have to add to do anything. So of course, from this picture, you probably can imagine that if I lower the temperature in some sense, or if I start to put in more and more particles, I can start to have this picture of solidification. You can see, if you, if you do that simulation, you can start to see the interface is moving. You have this solidification problem. Okay, so that's quite typical snapshot for PFC simulation. We know it's different than the phase field. It also is different from the molecular dynamic simulation in a sense that when we see atoms, the atoms, the atoms don't fluctuate around, they don't fluctuate in space. You just see this stationary kind of atom just located in certain space over time. So one way to comprehend what is this phase field crystal is that without too many proof, but anyway, I'm going to show you all the detail in later lectures, but immediately you can think the PFC is like a time average molecule dynamic simulation, which means uh, on the left hand side, here I'll just show you uh, one example of this uh, liquid solid coexistence, right? So what I mean by this time average molecule dynamic simulation is that we are expecting that the green particle, which means the particle in the liquid, is going to moving around in the liquid side. So over time, if you do a uh, many snapshots and doing the density average, you are not expecting to find some particular space in the liquid to have more opportunity to more opportunity to, to get uh, atoms, right? So you are expecting in the end, there's a homogeneous possibility to get the liquid, to get the, the, the density. So if you do a time average, time average sense of MD, you are expecting to see there's a homogeneous, homogeneous density distribution in the liquid side. And in the solid side, although in the molecules dynamic simulations, you are expecting to see fluctuation in space, but over time, because that fluctuation is going to give you a broaden peak of the atom. So if you really do uh, uh, carefully do a time average stem shots of all the particle positions, you are indeed expecting that 
uh, the atom is going to appear is in some certain place, and it should look like a, a, a stationary uh, distribution. So, uh, without uh, going to further theoretical side, very quickly, uh, I would comprehend the phase field crystal as a time average molecular dynamic simulations. Okay, so that's the very quickly we cover the fundamentals. What's the free energy of this methodology? And what is the uh, dynamical equation? It's a conserved local relaxational dynamics. And uh, as you can see, the example here, because it is a time average MD, then you don't see this uh, vibration mode of atoms, right? You average out of that mode. So which means the phase field crystal can access a much longer time scale than the MD simulation. So for example, I'm going to show a few examples uh, that all, all those simulation can be done uh, within a few hours. You can see the interface movement, the stratification process. So that's something uh, is quite distinct for this phase field crystal model. Okay, so it can access much longer time scale uh, than the MD simulations. All right. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so here I'm going to show you a series of uh, examples. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail, but I'm going to leave you uh, the reference. So if you're interested in certain examples, you can look up uh, the reference and this thing here. All right. Okay, so for first example, because uh, uh, many of you are working on solidification. So first example uh, is from Tang, and it, it is published in PRE in 2014. So what, it, what they are doing basically is just using the phase field crystal, uh, the methodology I just introduced. And since uh, we, we established that there are two parameters we can choose for this model. One is just this epsilon, right? One is just this epsilon. So their interpretation is that epsilon controls the anisotropy, the crystalline anisotropy. Uh, but there are some other way to, in, to in, interpret this parameter, but anyway. They're saying uh, epsilon is related to the anisotropy, right? And there's actually a, a reason for that. And the other parameter we just talked about is that you can control the mean density of the system, right? So if we just putting more and more particle into the system, the system is going to tend to solidify more. So uh, their interpretation is that a larger per sidebar, the mean density, uh, means a larger driving force. Okay, so, so if you just use the dip, uh, different pairs of parameters, like different epsilon and different per sidebar. And here is the the first column here. They are showing the e e equilibrium shape. So uh, if you start with certain uh, density, so that would be a, a solid liquid uh, coexistence. So you have liquid surrounded by solid, but the system will reach equilibrium shape. So from here, I think that's why they are calling the vertical axis as a parameter for this uh, anisotropy. Right? As you can see, the system is becoming more and more and isotropic as I move along to a larger and larger epsilon, all right. But other columns here, a more dense environment, so which means you are putting more and more particles, so it's going to drive the solid solidification process. So let's take a few examples showing that. So for example, if we look at um, uh, this example, right, you have a rather uh, an, an isotropic system with a, a slightly larger driving forces. So what I'm seeing here is, uh, uh, so basically it is a two-dimensional system. So atomistically, you are expecting a 2D hexagonal lattice in the phase field crystal model. And immediately you are seeing this six-fold symmetry of this uh, sort of dend dendrite. Uh, epsilon actually corresponding to, I mean, there is a relation to the anisotropy. That's actually a new project we are working on recently. Uh, usually that epsilon is associated with the temperature. So, uh, or the uh, interface width. So if you have a really diffusive interweight, usually you are expecting a more isotropic system than the facets, right? So you can uh, take epsilon either as uh, the, the, the temperature or the width of the interface. So the smaller epsilon gives you a more diffusive interface. So that's going to give you a more isotropic system. But when you move up, it's more like facets because the interweight width become shorter. Yeah, so that's a very good question. And we are going to relate the density functional theory with this epsilon later. Yeah, so there is a, a, a physics roots of the PFC. But so far, I'm just showing you, you the example.
All right, so it seems, work, it seems working now. So uh, if you zoom in, okay, if you zoom in this part, right? So you uh, actually seeing the atomicity detail, all the atoms, right, distributing here. From this figure, it's preferring a uh, certain direction. But if you shifting to other parameters, right, you can see this A and B is different. So if you, okay, uh, I would propose, I mean, now it's uh, frozen. So, oh, it's, okay, uh, let me restart my computer really quick. But uh, in the meantime, if you have any question, I'd like to be happy to answer. Oh, okay. So, um, we're expecting, or we actually know, or from the simulation, with the shorter epsilon, you start to see like facets. So, either they will prefer some uh, crystalline plane. And for different crystalline plane, they will have a different, uh, very specific energy. So you are expecting like sharp edges, like facets there. So that basically corresponding to a system with uh, high anisotropy. So we have a strong preference to have uh, your, your, your surface aligned uh, along certain direction, right? But now if you have something like really diffusive, really wide, later on we are going to connect a diffusive interface with uh, this, uh, or you, you can think of this way, all right. So if you have something really diffuse across few atomic plane into a liquid, right? So you start to have all those density waves coupling together. And the more diffusive interface you are getting, uh, you somehow smear out all the atomic detail in some, if you really have something really, really extended, like go over like uh, tens of atomic planes. So you really start to miss out all those atomic density. So it goes back to sort of like phase field model. So uh, epsilon somehow is, is corresponding to the uh, interface weeks, and that will also connect the PF system to different anisotropy. But that connection is not that straightforward. That's why uh, recently we are working on how to control anisotropy for, the, for this kind of uh, model. Right. Yeah, right. How close is it? Yeah, yeah. You mean how the hexagonal uh, anisotropic is coming out in the PFC? Is that your question? Or, yeah. Uh, they are related. They are related. Just like uh, Pr Professor uh, Gu uh, was saying, is that you is a com competition between the uh, enthalpy and entropy, right? So uh, if you can consider for higher temperature, there will be uh, uh, more fluctuation on the interface. So you are expecting a diffusive uh, interface there. But due to those uh, entropy effect, the system is, is expecting to be more and more isotropic. It's not. Uh, well, it, it, it's more isotropic, but as long as you have all the atomicity detail, the system is going to, always going to be an isotropic, probably on uh, surface anisotropy. Yeah, it's always uh, due to the atomicity details, right? So that's why I'm saying uh, there's a building interfacial anisotropy for the PFC uh, model. Yeah. 
Okay, so we were talking about uh, if the driving force is small, uh, this shape is based still determined by the surface energy and isotropy. But if we further increase the driving force, like the case B showing here, it starts to prefer a different growth direction. And what their interpretation is that it's a kinetic control and isotropy. So if you just changing the, the driving force, the system can switch in from the capillary and isotropy driven growth to the kinetic and isotropy driven growth. So, so that's the example they are showing here. But what's more interesting is actually the case D here, is that if you really have a very strong... We are going to talk a detail of, of the physical mineral epsilon in the third lecture. So there's a, a strong connection with the density functional theory of freezing. So there we can see clearly why epsilon has the meaning of the interfacial width and how it corresponds to the temperature. So here just uh, showcase what PFC can do and what people have been using a PFC to do the research. Okay, so I'm, not, I'm going to uh, skip the pointer, but so uh, like um, if you have a larger driving force, what's interesting here is that during the growth, because everything happens so rapidly, so along the surface, you can actually see everything happens so quickly, so the, the atoms cannot al align themselves properly to form single crystal. So you actually st start to see like defects is uh, nucleate during the certification process. So th that's something you are expecting, but uh, that's actually something that's not easy to capture uh, using uh, other continuum method, right? So you can have those uh, polycrystal poly defects and like grain boundaries, at least showing in this case. So that's the first example. So for pure material, you can doing a certification problem, but immediately you can see there's a building interfacial anisotropy and there's a competition uh, from this capillary and kinetic anisotropy and the defects, all the uh, detailed stuff. Yep. You mean the, the, the bottom color, right? The solid state. Yeah. yeah, it's an atom. It's an atom. So uh, we were talking about there's a Laplace in plus one kernel. So those atoms uh, arise from arises from that kernel. But things actually uh, also depends on the mean density, right? So if if the mean density is too low, you only have a liquid. And if the density is too high, you have a solid. But if you know how to set the system. Uh, at the coexistent region, so it's going to have this solid, very nice solid liquid uh, system. So here's one more example showing a facet den dendrite growth. So here, just a movie. So what they are doing is using a really high epsilon, which means relative low temperature or sharp interface. So they are showing the atomic de atomicity details, and also uh, they are showing the local uh, portion, like a mean free energy or mean density. So you can see the older. Uh, facet dendrite growth detail uh, using the phase field uh, model to do so. All right. Okay. Then, typically the phase field crystal can have this very ni nice solid liquid interface. You can have uh, like a diffusive interface or the facets. But back in 2013, Joe Buck is also a student working with Peter Fuhi, so, so we collaborate on, on this subject. So we develop a three-phase phase field crystal model. So which means you have a liquid, solid uh, feature from the phase field crystal, but we couple that with the phase field model. So in that case, you can uh, control better what's the facets or to represent solid vapor interface. Uh, if we got time, we're going to show uh, the 
more details uh, in the following in the following lectures. But you can see uh, in 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 that uh, paper uh, we are showing very nicely you can have this uh, step energy uh, occurring using this uh, phase field crystal model. So if you are working on the systems such as like uh, step meandering or step flow, uh, phase field crystal is it, it is the ideal model that you can use for your research. So here um, I'm showing one example of this step flow. So I hope you can see that uh, clearly that uh, in the very beginning, I intentionally to set the size of the step to be different. So you can see there will be a shorter terrace and longer terrace, right? Uh, those are the shorter one and uh, these are the longer one. So there's no strain to the solid. So what we are ex expecting is, is that there are add atoms coming on the top. So when you have add atoms coming on the top, the larger terrace is going to absorb, you have, has this uh, opportunity to get more add atom. So you are expecting the step is going faster. On the contrary, you are expecting a rather slower uh, growth for the shorter step. So you can see here, initially we have this uneven uh, terrace, size of terrace. But later on, uh, when the add, add end coming, coming in, you start to see the size become more and more even. So let me show you this movie. You can see uh, the step is moving and the shorter one becomes longer and longer. And as time progress, uh, you start to see the difference between the step uh, is reduced. All right. So that's uh, one more application, just showing that PFC can do a sort of fast in the steps. But we're going to show the detail in the later lectures. All right. And some of you are working uh, on the uh, binary solidification uh, uh, problems. So here is the uh, paper by uh, Elder back in 2007. They proposed a binary PFC model. So here you can see, uh, uh, so the top figure here is the atomic density, right? And uh, the, the second row here basically is the uh, concentration. So they just zoom in certain box here and you can get to see the details of uh, density uh, over that region. So uh, in the very beginning, you still have some Thing like liquid occurring here, and during the process, sorry, and during the process, uh, you are getting uh, more and more solid, uh, and you can see uh, there's a phase separation occurring for this binary alloy. And in this 2007 paper, Elder also shows uh, eutectic growth as an example, and also uh, uh, dendritic growth. Uh, and always the feature is that if you just zoom in certain part of uh, your simulation, like 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 either the you take course here or the dendritic course here, right? You zoom in, you automatically get all this atomic detail description from the phase field crystal. And you don't need to uh, put in anything to control the anisotropy. Everything is built in. Uh, but having said that, if you really want to control the anisotropy, there are certain ways you can manipulate your system. That's something we are going to talk about uh, in, in the lecture. So, so far, uh, all the example we are showing, I'm showing you here is about uh, certification. But of course, the PFC can be used to model the grain growth. All right. So, uh, I'm showing you uh, two papers. One is the Elder's work uh, in 2004, which is a very important paper to read if you are interested in PFC. So, uh, that's one of his uh, initial paper on the face of your crystal. So, on the left, uh, what they are showing you is that you start with, uh, of course, it is a two-dimensional system, uh, but initially you are putting the crystal seeds in a, uh, under a super cool liquid and start to evolve the system. So uh, you have three initial uh, crystallites, and over time it's going to coarsen. And because the orientation of each crystallite, they are different, so uh, somehow uh, they are going to encounter with each other, and you start to see the grain boundary forming, uh, like, like here. And if initially, if those two grains, they have very uh, similar misorientations, and they, they, they somehow they manage to uh, emerge into a, a slight, a roughly similar misorientation. But you still can see there is one uh, dislocation uh, forming right here. Right? So the PFC can uh, model the grain growth, and it can form uh, dislocation or the grain boundaries. And 
On the right hand side, basically, uh, what we did back in uh, 2012 and 2016 is that uh, we used the phase field crystal to study in detail. If you have a very simple system like a circular grain embedded in a, in a single crystal, uh, what uh, the grain shrinkage, shrinkage process uh, is going to happen. Uh, and according to a classic theory, usually uh, you are predict predicting this like curvature driven growth, right? So the, the grain is going to shrink and you can uh, make a statement about uh, how the energy change over time or the, 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 the grain size, the radius over time. Uh, but the advantage of the phase field crystal is that it automatically captures all the discrete details of these locations. So although here I'm showing you is uh, intermediate uh, misorientation, which means uh, uh, if you look at the grain boundary, it's actually composed of all these discrete dislocations, right? So that's something you are ex expecting for a low angle grain boundary or somewhere between a low angle and high angle. So if you just look at the grain growth problem here, you have a cer a center circle grain uh, cut off of this uh, single crystal and you will take to a certain degree and try to relax the system. So what's going to happen here is that you are going to see a facet to facet transition uh, of the surface. So sometimes you will see this uh, uh, has a kind of like uh, shape of the grain boundary, but uh, over some time you're going to see this uh, uh, rounded uh, deficit transition. And if you really look in the detail, uh, what caused that of uh, facet deficit transition is that you are seeing there's a lot of uh, dislocation and annihilation occurring during the process. Right, you have uh, all because this is still a two D simulation. Uh, you have you you have a lot of uh, H dislocation in this system with different Burgess factor, but you are also expecting different Burgess factor is going to uh, coming together. Then they can react and they can annihilate. Right, like here you are expecting like events is like uh, the, the 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 white uh, Burgess factor and the green Burgess factor is going to react, giving something else. So. Uh, you have all the process uh, occurring during this uh, uh, circular grain shrinkage. Uh, and you can also uh, design your, your system to be a really low angle or high angle. You actually see a quite a distinct dynamics for this grain growth. And for the high angle grain boundary, you are expecting to recover uh, the classic predict, uh, the prediction from the classic theory because the grain boundary is more a continuous structure. So you are expecting a curvature driven growth. But interestingly is that uh, if the misorientation is low, right, everything you have to go back and to consider all the discrete defects. So that's something uh, which is a strength of the face field crystal. You really have those dis discrete defects and how they uh, interact and how they come in together and how they react and uh, 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 annihilate. And also, you can set up something like uh, uh, a little bit more complex combination. Like here, uh, you can set up a, initially a symmetric tilt boundary. Like the top and down, it could be like plus minus uh, theta misorientation. And now you can also cut the central grain and rotate that to a certain degree and relax. And what we are showing here is that that is the first time uh, we are pointing out that for this kind of a setup, you can actually see a uh, grain translation, which means all the atom, it's driven by the couple motion. You can see the center plane, center atom is, is, is translating. It, it's driven by its couple motion, it's translating. So uh, that's something new that, uh, uh, which means you can use the phase field crystal, uh, all the defect structure grain boundary they are building, and they all capture, we show that, they all capture fundamental ge geometric constraint. Uh, people describe for this uh, discrete low angle grain boundary. So that's one of uh, one more of this uh, PFC application that you can do. All right. So here I'm showing the grain boundary mo uh, motion and also the defect. And of course, uh, epitaxial growth is one of the interests uh, during the modern day. Right. So uh, again, uh, 2004 Elder's paper is uh, quite a um, monu monumental paper to read. Uh, so that's the first time he shows that. During this uh, heat, heterogeneous epitaxial growth, we can see actually the, the film buckling and forming the dislocation over time. So you can see right here, right? So it's going to have this surface roughening, and you see the dislocation nucleate at some point as the film is growing. 
Uh, and in 2009, we looked uh, closely, uh, just to traditionally to study the ATG instability. So here is one movie showing that if you just simply compress your, your thin film, so what's going to happen is that uh, due to this uh, strain energy, the surface is going to undu undulate as expected. Uh, what PFC can, after, uh, can ac actually catch more is during the late stage, you see this uh, cusp performing at the trope. But there is a nucleation of dislocation. And our system is setting up is that I, I actually only show you half of the system. So it is a thin film. So there will be the other uh, solid liquid interface on the other hand. So they are forming a, a pair of uh, dislocation nucleations. So those two, when they form, they attract each other. So that's why you are seeing uh, at late stage, it forms and it's being attracted towards some other direction over here. So here you can see the nucleation of, of the dislocation and how that release the electric strain energy. So that's why in the end, the, the film surface goes back to flat. All right. And also you can do a 3D. So uh, most of uh, the example I was showing you, uh, they are all 2D simulations about the hexagonal lattices. But now you can also do a 3D. It's more uh, computational intensive. But you can see this uh, nano island formation. So again, you are seeing all the details, including the dislocation nucleation at tropes. So if you look closely at late stage, you see this uh, nano island. But in the meantime, you are also seeing the uh, nucleation roughly somewhere here, if you look closely. So the only thing we do here is just we apply a biaxial strain to this uh, BCC material. And on top and the bottom, uh, there's a liquid in contact. But uh, automatically, you, you are getting here is a nano ion formation. So uh, of course, you can ask uh, some other questions such as what would, what would be the patterning of this nano ion? And would, would that be like uh, uh, also a hexagonal uh, ion on top of it? So that would be something also interesting to know. So, but here just to show you that the, the PFC can also do uh, this uh, strain-induced instability, okay? So, which means elasticity is also building. You don't have to uh, put in anything. The PFC can get this elasticity right. And the reason is that if you think about the Laplace in plus one square kernel, we just uh, talked about uh, a while ago, right? So if the lattice spacing, if now locally, if the wave number is slightly different from one, so which means locally, you are expecting the free energy is a little bit higher. So you can do a uh, very simple expansion about, uh, uh, you can do a little expansion of that free energy. You are able to show that the linear elasticity is building also in the phase field crystal. So a quick summary so far is that uh, just using that very simple free energy functional, uh, you can have this uh, lattice forming, and that's going to give you a building interfacial anisotropy. In the meantime, it's also going to give you something realistic about the solid uh, elasticity. You don't need too much effort. You can also already go get loads the uh, physics property uh, right. So the next example uh, is about our work. Uh, it's a collaboration work with uh, Professor Guru. Uh, we are looking at this uh, grain boundary grooving. So as I just illustrated to you before, since we know the solid liquid interface interfacial property is properly captured by the phase field crystal. And also the grain boundary property, uh, I, I didn't show you a, fi uh, a figure here, but actually you can, com you can uh, measure the grain boundary energy and then compare with the reshockley law. So you can see a very good agreement with the PFC result and the reshockley law. So briefly, uh, basically, the PFC can capture the solid liquid property right and also the grain boundary property right. So the question we are asking here is that uh, uh, since uh, back in 19, 1960, right, uh, Mullen proposed that for the grain boundary grooving, you are expecting to see a shape preserving grooving angle during the growth. So, but one of his uh, assumptions is that during the growth, the Dihedral angle here is always a constant. Uh, but when we first encounter this problem, we see actually that the grain boundary, the description in the PFC or in the real material, it could be a low angle grain boundary. 
I mean, very realistically, you are expecting to certain setup. It could be a low angle grain boundary, right? So that basically, the, the question we try to answer here is that we, we think in Mullen's derivation, the assumption for a fixed dihedral angle is only valid if the, 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 the interface, they are, they are continuous, like in the phase field sense. But what happened uh, if there's a discrete description of the boundary? Would that change a lot of, of the uh, materials aspect uh, of the problem? So here's what, what we did, and we focused on this low angle grain boundary type of a grain boundary grouping. So uh, very exciting, what we are getting here is that uh, uh, the classic prediction for this dihe dihedral angle uh, is from the Young's equation. So you're expecting to get this uh, uh, blue dash line, right? But from our phase field crystal measuring, we are getting something else. We are getting much lower value of this cosine uh, plus L over two over here, right? So in the very beginning, I'm thinking uh, something must be wrong, or maybe the phase field crystal couldn't capture something uh, physical or realistic. But later on, we found out that it's because this dis discrete discrete nature of the grain boundary actually give rise to this uh, huge correction to the dihedral angle. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that uh, in detail, but here just to show you that the phase field crystal uh, is ideal to uh, study the interaction between the discrete structure boundary to the continuous boundary. Like here, the solid liquid interface is sort of a continuous boundary. But the grain boundary, because it's low angle, it is a discrete structure. So how the continual boundary is going to uh, react with uh, this uh, uh, continuous and, and, uh, the, and discrete structure, uh, discrete interfaces. So it's going to uh, give, give rise to something quite uh, different than the classic prediction. Okay. So in front I'm showing you here is that uh, we sort of uh, trying to uh, study the grain boundary grooving by putting uh, add atom into the system. So we are expecting to see uh, the solid uh, growing, right? So initially, the dihedral angle or the, the, the solid liquid interface, the tangent is indicated by this dashed line. But over time, at least in Mullen theory, the basic assumption is that the angle should not change over time. But due to this uh, discrete nature, you're actually seeing that, let me show you. you're seeing the angle is changing. And the reason is that if you look again in the simulation, especially focus on the distance between these locations, and why focus on the distance be between these locations? Because the misorientation of nearby grain is associated with the distance, right, be between these locations. So you are seeing here is what, it's actually the grain grows, but in the same time, the grain is also rotating. So you have to take that into consideration of building your theory. And that's quite realistic. I expect that also happen in real materials. Okay, so again, you can see uh, the PFC is probably a good tool to study this kind of uh, grain growth or the grain boundary grooving uh, phenomena. So it captured the discrete nature of the grain boundary. I mean, for low angle grain boundary, All right? Yeah, so, Consider these facts, right? Uh, we are expecting to see during the grain boundary grooving, uh, the if the angle changes, and whether that's going to somehow modify uh, modern theory. That's something people haven't done it yet, but something to think about. All right. Okay, uh, one more example is also uh, our work with, uh, collaborate with uh, Professor uh, Guru Rajan. Uh, it's our recent paper published on the PR material. So the idea is, is to look at uh, in a pure material system. If there, so here is like still a bicrystal, but it's a high angle bicrystal, high angle grain boundary bicrystal. So very similarly, we are trying to apply a lateral strain to the system, all right? But uh, collective theory is saying that if there's no elastic inhomogeneity of the, those two crystals, then you shouldn't expect uh, the surface 
or the grain barn to, to undulate because it's not going to re relax any elastic energy for the system. But what we're thinking is that uh, the grain barn itself is actually quite different than the grain, the nearby grain. I mean, the structure-wise, it's going to be quite different, which means if you look at the grain boundary, the grain barn should have a different elastic response compared to what happened in the nearby bike crystal. So with that idea, we propose a mean field theory. And our mean field theory predicts that it, there will be like a grain boundary structure transformation. And the grain boundary should undulate if there's a lateral strain applied to the system. And we, we are using the phase of crystal to validate our prediction. So here is just a movie showing you that uh, if you have a bicrystal, uh, relative, uh, not really high angle, but still like high angle grain boundary in 2D, if the applied strain is not too high, what you are getting is like this. You start to see uh, the grain boundary wiggle a little bit and it's stuck. If you look at the detail, what you are seeing here is that the grain boundary structure changes. Right, so on the right hand side, just zoom in locally. So it depends on the applied strain, you are going to get a certain grain boundary structure, which sometimes you would also see that in MD. And that also uh, uh, agrees well with our uh, mean field theory, our prediction. And if you apply a larger strain to the system, so what's going to happen is actually you start to see a huge undulation and the system is going to re, uh, to nucleate a dislocation because that would be a most efficient way to re, to relax the elastic strain. So you can also see something similar uh, to the ATG before, right? You still have this huge undulation, but very interesting is that you see there's a facet, right? It's a flat grain boundary during the evolution, and that's corresponding to one of the uh, coincidence uh, site lattice. So because of the PFC can capture all the atomic detail, like atoms, how they arrange. So the system also automatically captured this uh, coincidence site lattice structure, right? And also we showed that before, uh, it also captured uh, the behaviors of the dislocation, all right? Okay. Of course, there are more and more, uh, there are a lot of uh, research using the basic crystal. So here I'm showing you uh, a paper from 2012, so like 10 years ago. So it summarized back then what kind of pro uh, material, materials problem people are working on using the PFC. So uh, I would recommend you to check, this, uh, ch to check this out. But you can already see that uh, for the solid liquid transitions, people are looking at like thin dry eutectics or all sorts of uh, nucleation problem and grain boundary melting or grain boundary pre-melting um, and also like uh, crystal and isotropy uh, solute trapping right uh, for uh, things like that uh, alloy epitaxial growth and even people are using that uh, I think more and more people are using that to model a colloid uh, uh, or soft particle the pattern formation in that uh, something I didn't uh, really show you a graph, it's about a crack. I think uh, in 2004's paper, uh, Elder's paper, he also showed example of uh, the PFC modeling of crack propagation. Uh, so you can see a lot of like uh, dislocation dynamics, elasticity, plasticity. So in table one of, the, of this article, they basically summarized back then, 2012, people are using the PFC to do all this research in material science. But of, of course, it's it's like 10 years ago, right? It's a relative old article. So you can imagine that uh, nowadays people are, are really using PSC to do all sorts of research. Okay, so that's conclude the examples of the PFC uh, applications. So maybe we can discuss a little bit. Is, is there any question? Because I'm just showing you examples. Uh, so I don't know, I don't know uh, whether you have any question that uh, I can answer. Because uh, in the rest of the lecture, I will talk about uh, a little bit about the general concept of pattern formation. Because as I just did, as I just mentioned, we are going to see this uh, free energy functional quite often, right? But actually, in the very uh, the first time people proposed this free energy functional is back in 1980, 1977. 
And back then, people are, are starting the confection pattern in the liquid. So uh, in the rest of the, the lecture today, I will just uh, talk about the pattern formation in the René Bernard confection. And in the end, how people come up with that uh, free agent function. So it's less uh, material science related, but it's more pattern formation related. So before that, any question that I can answer? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And uh, in MD, you are expecting the surface is actually fluctuating, right? So, but if you take average, time, time average, you are looking at more diffusive picture of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, you are expecting actually a less packed region for this location, right? Because the atom cannot arrange properly. So also from the car, you are seeing that too. So it, it's, uh, in average, the atom density is less in, in, the, in these locations. Yeah. Okay. They are somehow related because people are also looking at the grain boundary pre-melting, right? So you have a grain and you start to uh, increase the temperature and you start to see the melting where usually it occurs at the region with lots of these locations. But I think the general idea is that you are expecting a less structures, uh, less older structure in those regions. So the time average sense you are expecting slightly less time average density in those regions. Yeah, so uh, does that answer your question? Something even from this 2D case, right? I'm showing you a low angle grain boundary. But since it's a triangle lattice, you can actually rotate the whole system by like 90 degree and do the same thing, do a bicrystal. And you immediately see there will be a different grain boundary structure. For example, we know the Brooks factor should be perpendicular uh, to the interface, right? So if you really draw in the Brooks factor here, it should be like horizontal. But if now, just doing what I, I say, you just rotate the system by 90 degree and do the uh, plus or minus two and a half uh, rotating. Now you are changing the dislocation structure, so you are starting to see a pair of the dislocation uh, overlapping because if, you, if I just do a 90 degree rotation, the allow the Burgess factor is not, you cannot have a, the one that's uh, parallel. 
that's a horizontal because uh, you will only have a Fergus factor that's along certain uh, lat lattice plane. So you only will have like either the plus three degree or minus three degree uh, Fergus factor. So in order to have this uh, average local average Fergus factor that's uh, perpendicular to a grain boundary, you start to see a pair pairing of dislocations. So even the uh, so the PFC can uh, naturally capture those features too. So I'm not showing you here, but just the, the details of those uh, low angle grain boundary, the facial crystal can uh, automatically uh, catch all the features. Okay, so um, let's move on to something different. So, but what I'm going to show you in general is the concept of the pattern formation. So it, it's all about how the system pick up this uh, correct correct risk length scale or the wave number and how the nonlinearity is going to uh, give rise to the pattern. All right. So um, the example I'm showing here is called the Bruce Later. Uh, it's a chemical reaction involving four species. But here just showing you as an example, it's a typical coupled reaction diffusion equation. In this system, if some control parameter here is B, B is roughly only here, is over some threshold. What they call the Turing instability is going to happen, which means although you are starting with something diffusive, right? If you have a diffu diffusion equation, you are expecting if something that's inhomogeneous in space is going to be diffuse, and in the end, it's going to be like uh, homogeneous. But Turing instability is saying, no, if you have a coupled reaction diffusion, although they are all diffusive species, but if you, you have them coupled in some way, then those inhomogeneity can occur itself. So if in this case, if you do all, all the calculation, if you uh, evaluate the, the, the dispersion curve, which means uh, for different wavelengths, if you have certain uh, perturbation in the system, what would be the, its corresponding growth rate? So immediately you have a feature saying that uh, if B is over some threshold, like in this case, if you do all the number calculation, uh, the, critical, the critical value is, is about 2.34. If the chosen B is above that number, you have this feature, you have a band of unstable wave number occurring in this system. So that's why it gives rise to a characteristic length scale. So all the pattern forming system would have this kind of feature. It, it could be a, two, uh, a reaction coupled reaction diffusion system, or it can be the phase field crystal, right? So here's just a general concept, what would be the basic ingredients for, pending, uh, for pattern forming system. You are expecting there's a pattern, uh, there's a specific characteristic length scale uh, being selected. And usually what behind that selection or the mechanism will be a competing forces between uh, at least two physical mechanism. And generally for Turing instability, they are talking about, maybe you have heard, they are talking about the inhibitor and the activator. So there are two species, they are playing a different role. They prefer different length scale. So the competition of those, those two length scales will give rise to this kind of uh, behavior. So you have a specific wave number that would have the largest uh, growth rate. Right, so if you run a simulation, it's going to give you some certain uh, structures in a space, uh, and usually the nonlinearity will set up what you are going to see at the later stage of, a, of the evolution. So uh, here, of course, you, you well, for certain parameter, you would look, you would have something look like uh, uh, 2D hexagonal atoms, and there will be some like grain boundary defects. But uh, that's not a point here, here because here they are describing. Uh, chemical reaction, but just saying that you would, would expect two fundamental ingredients for the pattern forming system. One is the linear, what we call the linear instability, right? So the system, uh, because there are competition between two uh, physical mechanisms, they are preferring different length scale. Through a competition, they are going to decide what kind of length scale uh, they prefer to form. So in the material science language, basically, is the lattice spacing. Right, you have a potential for different materials, that, so uh, you have a, a attractive and re repulsive uh, competition, and that's eventually set, set up the length scale of the system. Right, 
Uh, but in order to have, uh, for example, different lattice structures, then how come the nonlinearity will give rise to a different structure is something we're going to talk about uh, more uh, in the following lectures. All right. So U is the uh, concentration of the chemical species. So I have, I have two chemicals. Uh, so here's just one example not related to the phase field three. So just generally, if you see this kind of pattern forming, you have mixing few uh, chemicals in a container, for example. Uh, and usually you are e expecting those chemicals they are diffuse they, they follow diffusion equation right but diffusion the nature of diffusion is saying if you have some chemical concentration that's in homogeneous in space it's, it's going to diffuse away to make everything ho homogeneous uh, but Turing Turing Alan Turing is, is telling us that no if you have this couple the uh, coupled reaction diffusion equation it's going to select certain length scale it's going to make the distribution of concentration to be in homogeneous over space. And the reason is that for those two species, U1 and U2, uh, they have a different diffusive lens, and they are going to compete. And, it, and those competition will, will set a specific uh, preferred wave number for the system. Yeah, that's the gross rate. So if you create some disturbance of the concentration in the system, so you are expecting whether that kind of disturbance is going to grow exponentially over time, so that uh, that that rate is that sigma k. Yeah. You would expect them to But because V1, V2 are different, the length scale would be constant that is why the complex is the But the non terms are going to it's not going to become completely The pattern is connected, and the pattern will have a significant So it's basically a You can put all that Yeah. Right. Right. So uh, through the uh, length scale competition, right? So this curve just showing you uh, what kind of length scale is going to be picked up. But those are from the Linear instability analysis. So, which means uh, you only what you get is that uh, whether that kind of plane wave is going to grow exponentially or decay exponentially, right? Uh, but it, it never tells you what kind of uh, uh, density wave is going to select. For example, in two D cases, you have this uh, k factor that can go any direction from zero to two pi, right? So, any because the 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 space is isotropic, so it doesn't pick up any difference between different uh, wave numbers, as long as it's, uh, they have the same magnitude. The system prefers them the, the same way. Right? So linearly, the system cannot create symmetry. So the symmetry actually only comes from the nonlinear competition. Right? So uh, two ingredients are important. One is the system has to be able to, to select a specific length scale. So that's the linear instability part. But only with that, the system cannot determine the symmetry because they are all equal. Right? So you will need a competition between the density waves. If they prefer certain combinations, for, like, for example, they, they, they love like uh, plane wave traveling certain direction, like uh, six-fold symmetry. If, 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 if the system prefers that kind of com combination through the, the nonlinear competition, then you are expecting a 2D hexagonal lattice coming out of that system. So it has to be done through the uh, nonlinear competition. All right. Cost that again? Sorry. Yeah. That's uh, basically you can write down the chemical reaction. So, for example, um, it says that U1, you can get more U1 if it's encounter U2. And you probably have 2A plus B equal to uh, A again, something like that. So, uh, those nonlinear terms are from the chemical reaction. Yeah. A means. Uh, there's uh, maybe a fixed source coming to, to, to yeah. So uh, over time, U1 is being supplied, things like that. So 
Yeah, it's from the chemical reaction. Yes. Minus mm means -hmm. Right. Uh, for example, um, this part. So uh, if you have U1, it's going to help uh, the growth of U2. Right, but U1, uh, if you leave it alone, it's going to decompose uh, itself, right? Those terms. So, uh, if you check up this uh, Bruce later, uh, you can see there are four equations describing the whole chemical reaction. Uh, but they are assuming uh, two of the chemicals, they have uh, plenty of uh, uh, like supply, so, it, so they can keep those uh, as constant. So, in the end, you can simplify as like two coupled reaction diffusion equation. Okay. Right, so uh, what we're we going to do next is the, uh, actually goes back to swift holmberg uh, free energy functional. And it's, it is actually related to the convection rule, right? So for example, here I'm showing you is in our uh, atmosphere, you can see the cloud forming in certain regular way, right? So here you are seeing the, the, the cloud street uh, in Bering Sea or Greenland area. So it's in the grand scale, but you can see somehow the nature arranged its way, its way to have very regular, very beautiful pattern emerging itself. Or you can Google a lot of patterns. You're showing uh, a very regular uh, convection pattern. All right. So people are interested in, in this kind of regular pattern or in fluid mechanics, people are even more interested in like the forming of uh, turbulence, right? Uh, but in order to understand that compli complicated problems, usually uh, we would like to start with something easier. For example, how come in this convection system you can have something forming this uh, beautiful and, and uh, regular? So in the lab, you can set up an experiment. Basically, you can have two metal plates on the top and, and at the bottom. So you can control the temperature difference between these two metal plates. And you can um, give certain fluids, for example, either like uh, carbon dioxide or some kind of fluids in between. So what you are expecting to see is if the temperature difference between these two plates is reached, you are going to see some regular pattern forming here, right? So uh, they are using this feature that uh, for different temperature, like carbon dioxide is going to have different index of refraction. So they can use this very simple, uh, uh, lightning technique to see all these uh, con convection pattern. So once the temperature reach some threshold, let's say Tc, you are going to see this uh, convection. But if the temperature is below that, then the heat flow can be conduct uh, much more efficiently through the conduction rather than convection. Uh, so in, in that case, you don't see any convection rows. All right. So once you go over some threshold, you can, for example, you can have in these uh, stripes and also the hexagonal patterns. So those are just uh, in, in, in the lab, you're setting up this uh, very uh, simple Rayleigh Bernard convection. Uh, you can see those uh, regular patterns. So again, we are asking the same question. So uh, what determine the onset, which means uh, uh, how can we have to overcome certain temperature difference in order to get a pattern emerging in the system? And what determines the length scale usually, uh, as we described, is through certain competition. And what gives rise to the pattern? How can sometimes you, you can get stripe and sometimes you can get this uh, hexagonal uh, lattice-like pattern? The hotter region and cold region. Right. So, uh, Yes, and in a hotter region, you start to have the, 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 the gas come back, right? So it's, it's uh, locally, you can see the uh, gas is floating up. So the hotter region is going up, and it's uh, going to uh, pu push the, ga the gas away to the neighbor, uh, neighbor side. So it's going to come down here. So you start to see a lot of convection rows happen. So uh, the black and white here, basically, you can think that as a temperature profile. Or locally, you can think that's also a velocity, sort of velocity profile coming up and down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. So if you look at the hexagonal patterns, is that locally you have uh, everything flowing up in six directions, right? 
Okay, so uh, we talk a, a little bit about um, the onset of the instability. So in this case, relative number will be a good uh, indicator or a good parameter for, for, for this system. You can see uh, the relative number is a competition between the buoyancy force, which is proportional to the temperature difference. And in the denominator, there are two dissipating factors. One is conduction kappa, the other is the uh, viscosity of fluid. So you sort of uh, has the feeling that if the system is being uh, drive by the huge temperature difference, it's going to have convection row. But if the season has to, to take, a very, uh, take much efforts in dissipating the energy and conducting the heat through a conduction, it's not going to uh, have any convection row. So you roughly can get a feeling that uh, you have to overcome certain value of R, like here, right? RC here, that you start to see a convection row in this region. And there is a specific wave, wavelength being selected, KC here, right? You just right at that onset of, of instability, the system prefer to have this uh, two pi over KC, the wavelengths being selected. And very quickly, now without not going into detail, is that uh, that competition is through these two different uh, physical stamping process. So the system does not prefer to have a uh, very large wavelengths. Right, because the very large wavelengths, which means they will be uh, energy dissipated more as the uh, convection row goes along the plate, top and bottom. It doesn't also like to form a very short uh, convection rows as well. So there must be something in between. Things. So, so there are two different uh, physical mechanisms that are competing with each other, and in the end, they are going to select a certain KC. All right. And in finally, actually, we are going to make maybe not showing all the steps, but uh, just give you a concept of what's uh, usually uh, uh, we are dealing with this uh, fluid system. Of course, you know the equation of motion, uh, the Nefisto equation, or uh, if you consider the fluid to be incompressible, then you have to follow the incompressibility of the fluid. But the idea is that, so I'm, not, I'm going to uh, give you lecture notes, uh, but I'm not going to go through all the details, but just to give you some concept how uh, usually we deal with this kind of system. So the idea is to study the onset of instability, which means the system could be very boring, like there's nothing happening. Everything can be done through conduction. You don't have convection rope, right? So we want to, uh, to, to see an onset of that instability, which means if the relay number is slightly above this critical value, you start to see this homogeneous pattern or the boring system become not that boring. You start to see the, the growth of all those convection patterns. So usually what we are doing for linear, uh, uh, linear stability analysis is first we found this uh, boring state or the reference state. There's nothing happening, right? So which means uh, the fluid velocity is zero and temperature everywhere is homogeneous. And now next is we're putting the, the perturbation. We just say we can, we can perturb the temperature or give it, give it a little bit uh, velocity uh, distribution and to see whether that small perturbation grows over time or decay over time. So that's what we call the linear stability analysis because if everything is small quantity like the temperature field or the velocity field, then although in the equation of motions, there are nonlinearities. Then you can truncate all the nonlinear terms, just keep the linear term because the perturbation they are small. Once you start with a nonlinear problem, but you do this uh, perturbation and linearize your equation, everything becomes a linear couple equation. The only problem you are left with is a linear algebra problem. Then you can solve uh, eigenfunction, the uh, uh, eigenvalue problem, basically. So here it basically is the effort to find out what will be the uh, uh, unperturbed state. Like U is the fluid velocity, so uh, it should be zero, right? There's no convection. And there's a temperature profile because we are applying a different temperature on the top and at the bottom. So what will be the temperature profile looks like? And with all those information, what will be the pressure, right? So uh, because we are de dealing with the fluid dynamics, so those are the three things we need to know. All right, and the evolution equation or the governing equation is those three. 
So you have something about the velocity field of, of a fluid and also temperature field of the fluid over space and time. And uh, for simpli sim simplicity, we consider an incompressible fluid. So those three are the main equation uh, the, the, the our system is going to obey or to follow. Okay, all right, so uh, as we just described, we are going to perturb the system a little bit. So everything is from the previously determined the very boring state, and we are adding the perturbation thing in the temperature field, a little bit the theta field. And for the pressure, it's going to be slightly uh, away from uh, the, the PC. And the velocity field for the boring state is zero, so now I just keep a little bit the U here. And the rest of stuff is just to uh, make the, the uh, calculation uh, simpler. You can uh, make the old equation dimensionless. So that's all being taken care of here. Uh, you can define uh, some meaningful numbers for the fluid system, like the Prandtl number uh, and what we just described, the radiant number. Right, but we're not really doing much here. We are still uh, starting with all those evolution equation. It's just uh, make them uh, dimensionless. But the point is that we care about if we create all those perturbations, P and theta and U, whether those perturbations is going to decay over time or grow over time. And usually for those perturbations, you can specify what kind of uh, wave number they are having. Because for a general uh, perturbation, you can have everything, yeah, you, you generally can, can have anything you want. But those fields can be Fourier transform, right? So you can simply just look at for a particular specific wave number per kind of perturbation and to see whether that kind of perturbation grow over time or decay over time. So that's what we are going to do. And a common trick that usually uh, used in the fluid dynamic miscalculation is just to take a, a curl of the uh, uh, Nefisto equation because that will uh, get rid of the pressure term. So here just uh, some technical detail. But I'm going to leave these notes to you. But the idea is that once we have all this linearized equation, here we are assuming that the temperature fluctuation, right, now has this in the, the, the xy dimension. They have certain wave number, the kh, the horizontal wave number, right? And also for the philosophy, if I just cut certain plane, uh, it's going to also have that kind of uh, uh, distribution. And in the z dimension, um, if we are really talking about very simple convection, just one single row, then n just equal to one. But you can have something uh, like few layers, they are also doing, you can have convection cells, right? If I have two, which means you have like first floor and second floor, they are all convecting together. So that's the general insight for the perturbations. But the concept is that for a given uh, wave number, we are perturbing the system, we are going to, to, to uh, to calculate what's this growth rate sigma. If it's positive, which means the system can, can select that uh, specific wave number and to grow with that kind of perturbation. So uh, we plug that insights back to all those linearized, equa uh, linear, lin linearized equation and to see whether uh, how the sigma, it depends on the wave number we are assigning to. All right. So here, just uh, quickly recap, what is this uh, ho horizontal uh, wave number? So because we are looking at this uh, co uh, convection pattern from the top, right? So every wave number that we in two dimensions. But still here, uh, to keep it quite general, we are still con considering a convection in the third dimension. All right. So the only thing you have to do is just plug in. Uh, it's linearized equation, so you definitely can get what is sigma and what's its relation with the uh, different wave number. So I think the, the key results will be, let me see. So what you are going to get in is that the growth rate is going to depend on the wave number, of course, because like in the Turing instability, you have different wave numbers. So sometimes wave number will be, give you, slight, give you quite different the growth rate. So also we see that features here, right? It, it's a, dependence on the wave number uh, as we show here. So if you make a plot of sigma over k, uh, so you are 
having that uh, uh, similar behavior. So the system is preferring a certain case, but we already talked about the physics behind that because there are two competing uh, focus force. The system does not like to be uh, have a really large wave number or too short wave number. So it's going to have a, a proper wave number to be selected for the system. But of course here is that uh, the, the relay number is above some threshold. So that's why you have a, a, a band of unstable uh, wave number here. All right. Okay. So in short, uh, I just, uh, uh, you, you can rewrite that uh, growth rate as a function of k here. So delta k is uh, how far away it deviates from its uh, wave number that, co that has the maxima uh, sigma, all right? So it basically is a quadratic function. And you can do, you can rescale the time and the length and eventually to, to have this growth rate as a function of k in a very simple form. So I just rewrite this delta k as k minus kc, right? Because uh, delta k here is how far away you deviate from the maximum uh, unstable mode. All right, so that basically goes back to uh, the, the basic ingredients of the uh, pattern forming system, right? So once you, you are above the onset, then you start to pick up a band of unstable wave numbers, right? So sigma could become something positive. But once you deviate too much away from Kc, then this K minus Kc squared will give you something quite negative. So that's going to make that wave number perturbation unfavorable. But once, if K equal to Kc, then you are expecting a maximum growth rate equal to R, right? Okay. And again, because uh, it's from the linear stability analysis, so the system cannot prefer a uh, certain spatial orientation. As long, for a 2D system, as long as that's uh, on a, any direction in, in, in two, two dynamic space, uh, the system will basically treat it the same way. So there is no, no uh, break of symmetry in the system. Okay, so uh, in order to have that kernel, uh, people are interested in, 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 in proposing a simplified free energy function or simplified equation of motion that capture that kernel, that linear kernel. So the idea is that, of course, saying, um, although before we have this, uh, we are solving this uh, linear algebra problem, right? So you have the two field, is the velocity and also the temperature. So of course, the, the eigenfunction is a composition of those two fields, but that's just called that as phi. Anyway, you can uh, linear, linear compose those two fields to, 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 to have the proper uh, eigenfunctions. So, but now there is a problem for this kind of uh, kernel. We are, we are looking for this, this, uh, the magnitude of k minus kc and the whole thing squared. And we know in order to, to have that in the case in the Fourier space, right? So you, you, you need only the magnitude of k, but not k squared. So you are expecting in the real space, you need something to be taking square root of this uh, minus Laplacian because when you take a Laplacian of this uh, combined solution, you got this, this minus k squared. But now it, you don't have this, uh, uh, you don't have a magnitude of k, not k squared. So it seems like it's, not, it's rather difficult to have a proper operator in the real space to give you that kind of uh, uh, linear instability behavior, right? So there is a compromise, what you can do. If now the dispersion curve, right, is really close to the onset, which means instead of you have a wide band of unstable wave number, you only have a very tiny window, right? So if that's the case, if, if the unstable K is very close to Kc, then actually this kind of behavior, K minus Kc, whole thing squared, can be approximated by uh, the following uh, mathematical form. Uh, you can quickly check that. Uh, and it, um, so if k is very close to kc, then uh, this thing is roughly equal to one. So you can see that's a, a good approximation if the band of the unstable, unstable wave number is very close to kc. So you recover what happened uh, on the left. But if we do that, you have this like a plus b times a minus b, the whole thing squared. So it's going to give you something like uh, the k squared minus kc squared. And we know definitely how to deal that in the real space. 
So that's the Laplace internal. So the three Homberg equation or type of equation is, is using that idea. Although uh, we start with the Brinet Bernard convection, we know the linear stability, the linear stability analysis gives us a, a, a kernel look like this, but it's not that easy to handle in the real space. But with this uh, compromise, we can write uh, in order to recover that kind of a, a, a new form of the uh, dispersion relation. Now, we can write down the differential equation that capture this linear instability behavior, right? So now you have this uh, kind of field, partial phi, partial t, but this is exactly what we have seen before for the phase field crystal. I mean, similarly, not exactly, because only here we are retaining the uh, linear term. We don't have the nonlinearity yet. But you can see here the system is going to prefer the wave number that's equal to kc, because when phi has this form, right, with certain uh, wave number k, so the system is going to select the, the magnitude of k that's equal to kc, because that's going to minimize this square. So which means if this is zero, and that mode is going to have the maximum Gauss rate, because the Gauss rate is, go is going to equal to r. Okay, All right, so you can rescale the, the, the space and time again uh, in the end, uh, you can get something like this. So this is the linear part of the fluid homework equation, not exactly uh, the PFT, the PFT is the conserved dynamics, and this is not the conserved field, because in the fluid dynamics, you don't expect the temperature and also the, the fluid velocity to be a conserved field. But the advantage of this work is that you can formula uh, from this kind of behavior, there is correspondent free energy function I can write down, like we just showed in the phase field crystal, they are sharing the same free energy functional. The feature is always that the linear part will select a preferred wave number or wavelength for the system. So it's exact uh, like uh, what we are showing here. Okay, so that's just the, the linear part. We haven't talked about the nonlinear part or the pattern selection. So at least back to the René Bernard convection, because uh, we see these very regular convection rows, right? So if you're looking at, looking at the, the, the hot spot uh, where the uh, fluid, fluid particle is, is floating up, and also if you just shift like a half wave, wavelength away, you are starting to see a colder area, and also the part, particle velocity going down. From the equation, you can see there is a, uh, inversion symmetry. So which means I know the phi field is, so, is sort of a linear combination of the temperature field and the velocity field. And because that inversion symmetry, the only possible nonlinear non term I can put in for the fluid system is only the, phi, the, the simplest one would be the phi to the third power, right? So that will preserve when phi become minus phi, you are expecting the similar behavior. So which means you just shift or you change the, uh, the origin of your physical system, you don't see any difference, right, for the fluid system. So that's how you get the so-called sweet homberg equation right here. Okay, so people are using uh, that since 1977 to as a phenomenological model to discuss a lot of uh, pattern forming system because it contains two basic ingredients of this pattern, pattern formation uh, system. You have a, a part that will select the length scale and you have a, the other part to uh, select the symmetry uh, for the system. Okay, and as I was just saying, this kind of evolution equation uh, is actually follow a potential dynamic, which means it's very nice that for this kind of uh, equation, uh, you can find a corresponding free energy functional. And that evolution equation, simply just to uh, bring that free energy toward, uh, to minimize the free energy, right? Right, so that evolution basically just partial by partial equal to the functional derivative of that and with a minus sign. Right. So uh, that's the three homework equation. Uh, let me see. I will guarantee the energy decrease over time. And people are doing the simulation and also uh, compare with experiments. So you can see that uh, the simulation uh, from uh, a book by Michael Cross, you can see uh, with different parameters uh, and with some certain boundary conditions, you can get a stripe and something with kind of uh, like age dislocation as well, but that's just for stripe, right? You can see those are also like uh, grain boundary, things like that. And this is, the, this is 
uh, experience. All right. So let's basically conclude uh, what we have today. But uh, I really want to show you um, how to get this uh, Swift Homebrew free engine functional since we are going to use that every time when we talk about the phase field crystal. So it's better to know um, where it comes from and how that uh, related to the free engine functional we are going to use. Right. Okay. So that's pretty much of it today. Do you have any question? Yes. Yes. That's a conserve. Yeah. But here it's not. It's like a Allen Kahn equation because uh, phi here we know it's a combination of the temperature and the velocity field, right? So it's not a conserved quantity because you, you you can simply drive the system to be back to a very boring state. Nothing moves, right? Everything is zero. But you can still have something uh, compacted. So uh, that field is not necessary to be conserved, right? The nucleation of um, yep. Oh, so uh, so here is not about the uh, phase field crystal. It just gives you a sense of how you get that kind of free energy functional. And that free energy functional will have uh, definitely will give you a pattern emerging out of it. Uh, but whether that system or the phase field crystal has any physical meaning uh, is something we're going to talk, to talk about in the following few days. Yeah. Um, so you were saying about but back to back to your question, you're talking about nucleations in the what is the question again? Yeah, I mean, you mean nucleation in what you mean uh, just uh, give you a large fluctuation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to show you the thermodynamics of. This equation. So, if you have, so uh, for smaller and large C, you have this curvature effect, right? That's going to give you the pressure and chemical potential difference. So, you are expecting to see uh, uh, nucleations in this system. Depends on the size of your nuclei. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, this was a pattern formation. Just saying the systems. Uh, you, you, you start to see pattern, right? So pattern like stripe is kind of a pattern, but how the stripe emerge from something that's uh, initially that's homogeneous. So you start to see the pattern emerging, right? So that's pattern formation. So once you have uh, some perturbation, you know it's going to grow over time. So at least you are expecting to see a stripe formation, at least, right? Yeah, so if, so if you have something that uh, have a negative growth rate, so you, 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 are, you are not going to see them coming out, right? But with, with a band that's unstable, which means uh, one of them has the maximum growth rate, and maybe the nearby wave number is going to be a slightly lower growth rate. But they are growing exponentially. So over time, the difference is going to be very huge. So initially, you have a tiny perturbation. But very quickly, the system will select the one that has the maximum growth rate. So you are expecting to see that uh, wavelength coming out very quickly, right? Because even there's a tiny difference in the growth rate, the process is exponential growing. So you immediately see the amplitude of the growing it will be uh, quite different over time. Uh, do I answer your question? <laughs>
In this problem, we see that there is a range for which the simple changes and the quantity changes the sum. So the ones which are having a negative cases will all die. The ones which have passed those cases will go. So they are all going those cases anyway. Because of which the maximum is going anyway. It is not only one time. It is not necessarily going to be close to that point. If it is one day when it is close, it automatically will be close. So you can take the same decision and add a very far of those forms. Take a portion. Then you can show that the back portion is going to be close to that. Make long diamond type and then the special diamond diamond. So, this is what the top is. So, this is the same number of and it is done in two weeks. That's in the top. And it is done for two weeks. So, otherwise, it is the same thing. Around that position and looking at the top. So, then you can think of any random. So that is not gave basically both ways, but this one gave. You can get after you. So it is positive and the highest is the highest. That is not the common one. Because of this, the fact is that the body is the highest is the highest. So we are sort of doing that in the reverse way. Uh, is that we know from the experiments, right? This kind of Brennan-Bernard convection, they have a pattern forming seen in the, in the lab. So you can start with the fluid dynamics and get the already get the dispersion curve, the sigma as a function of k. So that's actually being solved. But the next thing is we want to have a phenomenological model to actually capture that dispersion relation is sigma is a function of like k minus k c squared. But we found that it's not that easy to do because that involves a square root of minus Laplacian operator. So people are uh, proposing that you can compromise with, uh, if, if that uh, dispersion curve actually, if everything, if I shift everything down, only the very tip of that is has positive growth rate and other, others are very uh, uh, below the zero, the sigma below zero, then you can actually approximate uh, this form by uh, what we have for the uh, phase field crystal. So you have this Laplace in plus one kernel coming out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, all right. Thank you very much.